Hey, today I'm interviewing Brian Burling of eModimo, and we're going to talk about the cool uh, products that he's building for photography and video. So if you're interested at all in, uh, in video, uh, you're really going to love what they've got going on. So Brian, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Stephen. So tell us, what is eModimo? Uh, Emotimo is a small company. Uh, started back in 2010. Uh, it's just me as a sole proprietor, LLC for the time being, but uh, we've got lots of contractors and bringing on some business partners as well. Uh, we focus on building out uh, very high value, portable, easy to use motion control products. So what's, uh, what's kind of an example of, the, of what somebody would do with the motion control product? Uh, well, what's hot right now uh, with uh, there's lots of movies uh, that use it. There's tons of television shows that use it in transition. When you know what to look for, a moving time lapse is uh, something you'll see in, in almost every production. And so uh, doing that for uh, doing a moving, panning, tilting time lapse is kind of a hot topic right now. And our Emotimo PT uh, for the pan tilt or the uh, TP3, which is our other product, uh, um, they're both pan and tilt heads, both precision pan and tilt heads, and you can put the product on top of a tripod and your camera on top of the product and uh, very easily set up a moving time lapse shot. Nice. So are these mo mo um, mostly for digital uh, SLRs, for video cameras, or just anything you can hook a tripod up to, you can use this, this product? It's mostly for digital SLRs or video cameras. Uh, we interface, um, so we're taking lots of shots with them. We can, use, we can set up what's called a shoot, move, shoot sequence, an SMS sequence, or a video sequence. And so with most digital SLRs, we actually interact with the camera too. We send the shutter signals saying, take a picture now, take a picture now. With video cameras, we just provide the precise motion. But with, um, with a film camera, with a film 35 millimeter uh, SLR, probably not going to uh, have as much use out of that, but it's most of the digital realm. Very cool. So is this more for the consumer space, the professional space? Who are the types of customers that you, that you currently have? Uh, well, that's the exciting thing. We, we thought, uh, I, I targeted me, which is a consumer, um, kind of a prosumer. I like toys, I like hobbies, um, I like gear. Um, and so I looked at some productions of Discovery's Planet Earth a while back. I'm like, oh, I want to do that too. And there's really nothing in the consumer space. And so created this product uh, trying to hit a price point where I thought it could be palatable for a lot of uh, digital uh, SLR owners to put one in their kit. Uh, the exciting thing is that the early adopters of this were actually professionals and so we have, uh, you'll see our stuff um, on Discovery Channel, there's, there's certain places it's there, the History Channel. Um, so we get some production houses buying this too and it's not because they're looking for the price point, they'd be willing to pay actually much more. What they're looking for is portability and ease of use and so we provide that, they found us. So what was your initial price point that you were shooting for? Uh, I was aiming for 500 bucks. Did you, did you hit it? Yeah, with the PT, we still sell it. Uh, it's about 510. We uh, upped it a little bit with uh, some better components in there. But yeah, for the acrylic pan and tilt head, for about three and a half, four pound cameras, we can still uh, we still hit that and still sell it. And is is that a kit? Was that a kit? I believe was that. So it's like I would put it together myself. No, no, it's full full blown product. We're oh, probably nice. underpriced on this. So uh, yeah, get it. Can you get it now before you raise the price. Yes, as uh, hope, hopefully we'll uh, we'll have a little bit more room to uh, to raise some prices as we're as we're expanding out a little bit. But really, we want to keep that as low as possible. We're trying to enable a lot of different types of photographers, and that that PT is uh, we sell to uh, students and things like that. So trying to keep the price low. Very cool. So, is this one of those products where, other than you know, for, for the consumer side, they see it and they're like, "That's really cool." I don't know what I would do with it, but I want one because I mean, that's what I what I I thought when I saw it. I was like. That is awesome. I would it's, figure out what to do with it. It's a fun piece of gear, and we're going to be putting up some tutorials on step by step on how to use it. So it wouldn't actually be a huge leap for you to say, "I know exactly what to do with this." But um, it's actually a fun piece of gear. It has a remote control attached to it. It's a Wii remote control. It's it's orange. I made it when I made it. I wanted to have it look more like a toy than a professional piece of gear because it is fun and absolutely fun to use for it. So, so what is your background? I mean, because you know, you obviously you're into photography, you're into video, but how did you come up with this, you know, this idea in the first place? Ah, okay. So I was a mechanical engineer by trade in school, uh, but shortly after that, 
I decided I didn't want to work with a bunch of uh, engineers with a white picket fences and, and families and things like that. So right out of school, I went into consulting, did big time consulting, and uh, I won't I won't mention names in there, but I got a lot of experience on uh, programming, a lot of experience with various database design, and really started interacting more with customers and learned how to run a business as well. So. About 10 years in, I decided that uh, I really love something tangible, something I could hold in my hands, yeah. and uh, stepped away from that world to, uh, to start this up. And, and you've, you've, you've got the design experience. Obviously, you're not just you know, some random person who's like, I like photography. I mean, you actually have the engineering skills to say, I, I want to do this, and I can do this. Yeah, when I started out, I actually didn't, when I left my job, I didn't know what I was going to be doing. That's, well, that's an exciting thing. This wasn't the idea. In fact, there's a book of about uh, 85 ideas that I have uh, that I developed over three months. I just brainstormed left and right with friends, what can I make? But really tried to focus in on what are my strengths, um, how, can I, how can I have an advantage in this market, and how can I bring something to market quickly? Not only strengths, but what are my real interests? So this is, I've tried to set up an build my dream job. Very cool. So yeah, so you spent three months just designing what should I build? What kind of company should I create? It was, uh, it was really two months in where this one bubbled to the surface and said, okay, I, I think I have the skills necessary to do this. I have the network of individuals that can help me do this. Um, I have the right funding for it. I have the right tool shops uh, available for me. So uh, yeah, it was about three months in when I decided this was it. So once you decided this was it, how long did it take to go from concept to sellable product? Uh, that was a uh, little less than a year. It was uh, nine months. Nine months, okay. And, and you know, walk me through the process that you, that you took. You've, you know, it's like, you know, did you sketch it out? Did you make a bunch of prototypes? Did you just you know, try and get it to work and then figure out how to manufacture? How did you go through that? Well, it was, uh, it was nine different prototypes uh, in, the, uh, in the actual, in the actual build process. So this wasn't just, a, as you can guess, it probably wasn't just draw out the final one and, and figure it out. Yeah. It, was, uh, it was really trying to break down the motion. Uh, with, with photography, precision is really important. And so getting precision from $5,000 worth of components was pretty darn easy. Um, so very quickly, I figured out the limiting factor. I said, well, getting the precision, getting the repeatability is going to be the key here. And so I started investigating and ordering up tons of different parts, off-the-shelf parts, that um, I thought I could customize and I thought I could put together into the right drivetrains. And so that was really where I started, was drivetrain, and uh, tried to figure out a good, good solution there. Um, all the while, my first prototype was out of wood. I built it, uh, built it in my friend's garage um, and uh, tried to put these, these parts together in a way that I could test them. So I was looking for answers more than I was looking for proof of concept or something I could take to a venture capital firm or something like that. This is more along the lines of, I know the components. And so those key things that I didn't know enough about were the drivetrain, uh, which I knew I could figure out with my mechanical engineering experience. Um, the other side was the electronics. Can I put together something for a reasonable price that could bundle together in a way that uh, uh, is, uh, is sellable? And so I uh, actually picked up, you know, month one and a half, uh, picked up Arduino for the first time. And that's what uh, picked up, uh, well, that was what uh, the Emotimo product is based on, is an Arduino Uno. And played around with that and uh, started putting together components around it and uh, to actually test the drivetrain. So. so, yeah, so you're actually using Arduino in the, product, in the production, the sellable products. We are. We are. People like them. It's a great way. Uh, it's not too much money. It's not the way to go for a um, thousand runs uh, or thousands of runs, but uh, for, the, uh, for the 50s, hundreds that we're doing, it's a great place to, uh, it's a great place to go. And people like shields. So. <laughs> so did you find that you were having to create a lot of custom parts to build this product, or was it a lot of off-the-shelf parts combined with some custom design? It's, it's a little bit of both. I mean, the customization is fine if you can make the part easily. So it's designing it for manufacturability, which is the key. So um, whether or not you, if you, have, if you have laser cutters and you have uh, CNC mills at your disposal, um, customized parts aren't that bad, as long as you think through what's it take to make 50 and 100 of these things. And so during the, uh, this, the hard part was not just, hey, let's build a product, let's make something really neat. It was thinking through and breaking down how much is it 
you know, at one of these, what, what does it cost time-wise, dollar-wise? At 50 of these, what does it cost uh, dollar-wise and time-wise? And always be cognizant of that, trying to hit that, for me, it was that $500 mark at the time. That was one of the things that I'd heard was designing and testing your product is, is easier. I mean, it's hard, but it's easier than actually getting it ready for manufacturing and make it manufacturable. That's really when it becomes a challenge. Was that the same thing you had? or? Yeah, but I thought through it. I think that was one of the things I, I did well along the way in the, in the warnings I'd heard uh, from other people is, you know, make sure you think about suppliers too because it's great if you can buy you know, uh, $3 gear um, off eBay and you're like, oh, that's wonderful. Um, but, you know, try to source 500 of them and, you know, you just you have to go back and do a complete redesign because you just set up this big um, hitch in your, uh, in your supply chain. So it's a matter of uh, going with going with larger suppliers, making sure you understand uh, lead times uh, along the way, uh, because at the start you want to be light, you want to be nimble, you want to be lean, and you don't want to have like a 12-week lead time for a part when you all of a sudden get 40 orders. So it's uh, it's really thinking through that uh, up front was the was the hard part. You can't just make it and then figure it out at the end. So really, once you're designing, you know, pr you know, past the prototype and you're looking to do production, you really have to look forward and see what can I get, what's going to be available to me in a time quick enough that I can use it and design that into the production as opposed to just, here's what I want to design and then going out and trying to figure out how to, how to source it. Uh, I would say it's even beforehand. I mean, as you're prototyping these things, uh, it's really easy to buy, you know, like, okay, here's my, here's my budget. I'm going to go spend $5,000 on parts and pick out the stuff that works. Well, no, you got to say, what's what do I have available to me? Where's the readily available three dollar part that can fit well in here? And so you spend a lot of time doing that rather than building something that works and then trying to reduce the cost. It's like, what can I do with the readily available parts? And so with um, you know everything's not custom on this. It's a, a chunk of it is, but really thinking through up front, you know, here's here's what I have at my disposal disposal rather than let me try to work into the low cost after it's all built and, and uh, tested. So that's a really good point. So, you know, going through this process and, and, and I'm guessing, did you, you self-fund or did you do a friends and family round? Did you? Uh, no, self-funded on this. I, you know, wanted to keep this, uh, keep direction exactly where I wanted it to go. And I didn't want to, uh, you know, bring in friends or disappoint family. If you know failure is likely, you know it still could be. So we're we're growing up, but um, really I wanted this the uh, successes and failures to uh, to sit on my shoulders on this one. Okay, good. So if I wanted to, you know, start a business like this, is this something I could fund on credit cards, or is this something that I should be saving up years and years for? How much how much money did you know was it required to start, you know, to get to your first product? So before I knew this was going to be a Motomo, um, that three months in, two or three months in, um, I gave myself what I thought was going to be a two-year run. And what I wanted was three ideas uh, to be able to, to work through three of those 85 or so ideas, the top three, and try and fail them and know that at the end of those two years, it's like, well, I gave that a shot. That was sort of like the worst case scenario was two years out, I would be able to I'm not earning a dollar, be able to flip the switch and say, okay, gave it a shot. Those are my ideas. I'm going back and throwing on, uh, throwing on a suit and tie. I'm going to go make financial databases work again. I'm going to get the white picket fence thing going now. Yeah, there's a, see if I can call some more engineers and uh, see if we'll give me a job. But it's, um, yeah, so two years is what I, the run rate, just living expenses plus, uh, plus capital for uh, an investment for, for prototyping these ideas. So I saved up a big chunk. It was a uh, it wasn't monstrous though, and it got um, got the deal got a whole lot sweeter when Tech Shop, which you're well aware of, uh, Tech Shop, that's a good place. Um, when that popped up, it uh, my run rate uh, went down quite a bit, and my available tooling uh, went up quite a bit. So uh, it was only a year uh, about a year in that uh, a year and uh, a year and a half in. I uh, was still on the same idea, and cash flow was positive at that point. Very cool. So you're you're actively using TechShop now? Uh, we use it for our prototyping still, and for minor production uh, pieces that we haven't outsourced yet. Okay. So how, how many uh, how many units are you selling a month? Because you mentioned like fifty, one hundred. You know, is is it kind of in that ballpark? 
Uh, well, we're not quite uh, we're not quite selling a hundred of these things a month, but uh, we have our good months and our bad months. I'm not going to tell you the sales figures exactly, but uh, it works for uh, it's working for right now, and we're growing up. So actually, marketing is our biggest challenge and letting other people know about it. But once they do and they see it and go, what can I do with that? It's actually a, still at the right price point where we're where it's a pretty easy sell. So uh, we're growing up, but uh, we're not we're not raking in uh, millions of dollars yet. So, so what are your plans for the future of this business? Is it you know you want to grow it to selling thousands, tens of thousands of units, or you know you want to keep it more niche? Well, you know, what are you what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I want to keep this ten years from now. I'm hoping Emotimo will be releasing its next you know its fiftieth product. So uh, long term, this is a this is a passion play. I don't I'm not looking for big outside investment to and some liquidation event. I'm I'm really looking to keep on making innovative products. With a, with a small team of people. And so uh, outsourcing and contracting the right way, I think we can still stay small and still stay true to our vision. So you're, you're more focused on staying nimble and you know, following what you're passionate about rather than growing this into a billion dollar business. It's yeah, a billion, that's a whole lot of money. I'll, uh, I'll let other people deal with that. This, it's fun actually interacting with the photographers. It's fun really listening and being able to create products. Um, that serve their need. So uh, I think you grow up that big. It's tougher to uh, tougher to do that. Um, but you have a billion dollars. You don't you don't need to do anything anymore. You just buy your own island. So no, this is uh, this is meant to be a small niche business. And uh, and I think we can. There's a balance. There's somewhere in between where it can be lucrative uh, for me and the uh, and the people that are working with me. Um, but it doesn't. My goal is not to grow this to a large business. See, I mean that's really cool because it seems. Like when I've talked to a lot of other maker entrepreneurs, they're really following something they're passionate about that is going to make a difference, but they're not necessarily trying to build a company the size of Facebook. They're like, I really love doing this. I would do this for free. I just happen to make money at it, and I want to be successful. But that's what's really cool to me is, is you know, it's that passion. It's that this physical thing can make a difference. I just want to keep doing it. Yeah, I mean, if you're waking up each day and you're like, "Wow, if I only can reach my IPO, whatever," and you're not you're not passionate about it, it there's there's not the same same quality in there. It really is you're trying to fabricate money rather than uh, value. Very cool. So, what are some of the lessons you've learned going through this process that you, uh, that you've been through? You know, some of the things like you know, as an inspiring entrepreneur, I want to become a maker entrepreneur. What are some of the things that you know I should be aware of? Oh, it's a big open question. Um, you know. Figure out yourself first. That's that was where I started. Um, looking in and doing in what was it? Some of the, what color is your parachute? Is a great book that kind of you get poopa and people say, oh, that's you know blue, green, ah, ha ha. But actually understanding yourself and understanding what your real needs are and what your real interests are. That's the start because if you're looking for this passion play and you're looking to actually do something and find something that you love, um, don't look anywhere else other than. Them right back at you. So run through some of those things and understand it and really be objective about it. And some little small bubble in there is how much money do I need to survive, you know, what's comfortable. And that shouldn't be driving you if you're doing this for, uh, if, you, if you really want a passion um, project. So that and then um, being objective, breaking down ideas, try lots of things out and look towards, uh, looking towards others for uh, not just validation, but for objective feedback. Uh, finding a trusted network of people that you can bounce ideas off of. Working in a silo is no fun, and you, you really want to. You know, tech shop's a good place for that too. But really, develop your own personal network of. I want to bounce this idea off. Here's the here's the model. Here's the business plan I've I've outlined. What do you think? You know, getting that, uh, getting all sorts of feedback uh, early and often is uh, tremendously important. Before you jump on in, before you make five different things, and you know, at the you know, on a 3D printer, it's like really step back and, and try to figure out which direction you want to go for you. Very cool. I, no, that's really good advice. I may have to check that book out, as I've heard about it, never read it though. There's a few of them that I that I tout um, that I think have been really good over the years. Um, the what color is your parachute? That's good. There's this little bubble diagram. Here's my interests. Here's my people. Here's all these other things. Um, emotional intelligence is a huge one if you want to figure that one out. And then getting to yes is a is a time uh, honored uh, let's not uh, let's not battle type of thing. It's a negotiation without giving in. So uh, 
there's my little endorsement. I get no money for these books, but I think they're great. So those are your, that's your three that are on your bookshelf? Uh, well, yeah. You can actually go back and reference them over and over again. And uh, I haven't done What Colors Your Parachute for a few years now, but that's like, you know, somewhere in the middle of life when I'm like, well, what do I want to do next? It's like, well, really understanding that, that was a starting point. Uh, getting along with people is 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 a tremendously important along the way too. So those are those are a couple of good ones. Patent protection isn't something that I, I think we'll ever pursue. We want to keep uh, we want to keep our designs open. We want to uh, be more nimble rather than uh, playing. Ooh, here's another good book if you want to read something interesting for entrepreneurs. Unlocking the Sky. I can't remember who wrote it, but it's about the Wright brothers and about how they died miserable. And how they uh, the world sees them as innovators, but they're actually uh, they actually were just a bunch of guys trying to eke out as much money as possible from uh, from ailerons, which uh, they did wing warping technology. And uh, long story short, uh, the IP route, uh, depending on how you go about it, could be really good if you can get some licensing deals, or it can uh, make you die uh, happy and or unhappy and alone. Good, uh, good to know, because I definitely don't want to do that. Orville and Wilbur. Not on my top ten list of cool people and innovators. Too bad. I liked him, but I'll have to read that book. You read it, and you'll, it might change your opinion. I will. All right, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Stephen. You have a great day. Thanks.